This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a class on the causes and military objectives of the Civil War, taught by Douglas Dowds of the U.S. Army War College. This class was taped in September of 2020. The Union officer you see in the front of this slide is Harrison Jeffords. At the beginning of the war, he's a 26-year-old. He signs up with the rest of his town to go ahead and join. Now, he's a lawyer who graduates from the University of Michigan, but when the war starts, he's actually running his dad's brick-making business in Michigan. He's not married, so he sits down with his mom to write out his final will and testament. Now, he is a fairly talented individual. He starts off as the company commander. After two years of war, though, now he is the colonel of the 4th Michigan. Between the Battle of Gettysburg and the battle that happens right before Gettysburg, two months prior, Harrison goes home on leave. Uh, So he has a vacation of about two weeks. While he's home, uh, the town members join him as he gets ready to hop on the train and head back to his unit. And they present the unit with a brand new flag. And you can see the battle flag in this picture. Uh, Battle flags are important in the American Civil War. And at a time when command and control is as loud as you can yell, as fast as you could ride a horse or send a runner with a note, in the smoke and noise of battle, when the big flag goes forward, we'd go forward. And when the big flag goes back, we'd fall back. So you never wanted to lose your flag, not only because of the ensuing confusion that would cause, but also because we had all joined as a community. People from our community had died defending that flag, and you never wanted to lose your flag. After two years of war, the 4th Michigan flag was fairly shot up, and so the townspeople show up and present Harrison Jeffords with a brand new flag for his regiment. And he pledges to them all to be its special guardian and defender. Now, on July 2nd, at about 7 o'clock in the evening, the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, Harrison Jeffords and the 4th Michigan would find themselves back in the wheat field. And you can see it there for the second time that day. In fact, they'd be fighting some Georgians that were coming over a wall when one of his soldiers would turn to him and say, Sir, I'll be damned if we're not facing the wrong way. And he'll look and he'll see some Georgians coming over a hill. He'll refuse his flank, that is, bend it back into his whore. He realizes the battle flag is out in front of his line. He'll draw his sword, run out there, and run it through a Confederate who's just about to grab it. A Confederate will shoot him in the leg. One of his men will shoot him down. Three Confederates will rush forward, knock over Harrison Jeffords, and they'll bayonet him to the ground. Harrison Jeffords will be the senior ranking Union officer to be killed by a bayonet in the the American Civil War. As they carry him from the battlefield, with the flag, I might add, his final words are what that flag represents. His final words are mother, mother, mother. Now, we can talk about symbols and how they evoke emotions and how emotions inspire us to think powerful thoughts and those lead us to do powerful actions. But what I want to start today is how we communicate. There's a very old study that says when we communicate, only about 7% of our communication are the words we speak. 38% is the tone, tenor, and tempo of how we speak. And fully 55% of our communications is what you already know. It is our facial expressions. It is our body motions. Our actions speak louder than our words. As Harrison Jeffords is carried from that field, there's no one who does not understand what he meant by special guardian and defender. Good afternoon. My name is Doug Dowds. I'm a professor from the Department of Military Strategy Planning Operations. I teach the Advanced Strategic Art Program Seminar. I'm a retired colonel, and I'm going to give you the pre-brief today for your Gettysburg staff ride. This is some of the pre-work we do before we go visit the battlefield. Now, staff rides have been uh, a historic part of the military tradition. Uh, Helmut von Mulkey, the elder, used to take his staff, put them on a train. They would ride out to a key piece of terrain, and because his staff was riding on horses, it became a staff ride. Now, they were looking for key terrain that they would ultimately fight on. At the turn of last century, Eben Swift would take some uh, army majors that were at the command and staff college down to Chickamauga. Maga battlefield, and that would begin the American tradition of using staff rides to educate future leaders. Now, A staff ride is different than a historical tour. A historical tour, what we do is we look at the past from the lens of today. In a staff ride, we look at today from the lens of the past. And so effectively what we want to do is do some pre-study to determine facts. And then we want to go visit the field. We want to walk on the ground, establish cause and effect, and then make some analysis. Or more simply, what I would offer we're trying to do is to determine the what, the so what, and the now what. What happened? What did it mean back then? What does it mean to us today?
This is the West Point class of 1915. They're on their staff ride to Gettysburg, sitting on the church of, sitting on the steps of Christ Lutheran Church in downtown Gettysburg. This is the class that the stars fell on. 287 members of that class will graduate. 59 of them will become general officers, including two five-star generals, General Eisenhower and General Omar Bradley. They use Gettysburg as a leadership laboratory, and we will do the same. What I ask is, make it your day. Be interactive. Engage with the staff ride guide, but also... Part of the way this works is only a guide gives some of the impetus. The successful today will be determined by your ability to engage, bring your experiences and your study to bear. Okay, in order to make this successful, what I want to do is provide us some context. And my intent here is not to insult anyone's intelligence. But this is going to be a bit of an eighth grade civics class. Mostly because what I want us to do is when we get to our first stop, I want to be on July 28, 1863. So that we can all understand how we arrived there, let's just catch ourselves up. So first, let's start with some simple questions about the American Civil War. What caused it? Was it about slavery or states' rights? It was absolutely about slavery. In fact, of all the political institutions that could have mollified the disaster that is the American Civil War, they all break down over the issue of slavery. The Democratic Party, the Lutheran Church, uh, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, uh, all of which why they see the institution of slavery, much of what we talk about over time, states' rights, economic differences between the North and South, cultural differences between the North or South, were only symptoms. The American Civil War is actually about slavery, and in fact, it's really about African-American slavery and the spread of that slavery into new states in the West. And so we should ask ourselves, how does this happen? It requires us to go back in time to the Constitutional Convention in 1887 there, they are trying to put together a nation. If you think about it, there's 3.8 million people in the United States at that time. 700,000 of them are slaves. There's slavery in every state in the nation with the exceptions of Massachusetts and the districts of Vermont and Maine. As they try and cluge together this nation from whole cloth, uh, they make some compromises. Uh, And really, this shows up in our Constitution in three places. One, the three-fifths compromise. How are we going to count slaves for representation in the House of Representatives? This is the three-fifths compromise. The second place we find it is in a fugitive slave law that says even if you're a slave and you make it to a free state, you are still a slave. And the third place we see it is... Regardless of what people think about slavery at the time, most everyone agrees that the slave trade is wrong. And so what they do is they put a stake in the ground that says 20 years from now, we will get out of slavery. On January 1st, 1808, the United States is out of the slave trade. Nonetheless, why slavery doesn't show up in our Constitution with the word slavery, it's persons of labor, persons of service. This is the fuse that 75 years later leads to the American Civil War. And what we really do is have this march, this series of compromises and crises that lead us there. It starts with the 1820 Compromise. Again, trying to figure out what's going to mean for new territories to come in. Will they be slave or free? The 1820 Compromise, the Missouri Compromise, says every time we add a slave state, Missouri, we're going to add a free state, Maine, so that we can maintain parity in the United States Senate. At the time, they also say no slaves above 3630 latitude. 1831, the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion. Uh, This is a problem for many states in the South where there are more slaves than whites. 1832, the Nullification crisis. South Carolina doesn't believe they should have to pay federal tariffs. Andrew Jackson thinks otherwise, but that the states might push back against federal authority has now been established. We jump forward to the American-Mexican War, 1846 to 1848. This is going to add all kind of territory to the United States, most of which is in the Southwest. A congressman from Pennsylvania, Wilmot, will put together a proviso that says no slaves should be allowed to go in that new territory. If you're a Southerner, you believe the Washington, D.C. is now against your interests. 1850 compromise. Now what we do is we add a free state, California, but no corresponding slave state. We we break parity in the Senate, never to be reestablished. For that, they get a very powerful fugitive slave law. 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe writes Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now the abolition or the end of slavery is not just a political issue, it becomes a social issue. The 1854 Compromise, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, we do away with all the compromises we've had up until this point, and now it is popular sovereignty determines whether a territory comes in as slave or free. This gives us things like bleeding Kansas. 1857, the Dred Scott decision. 
which reaffirms that slaves will not be free even in free territory. If you're a conspiracy theorist and you live in the North, you believe Washington, D.C. is against your interests. 1859, the John Brown raid. Now, all of a sudden, it's not just about a slave rebellion. It's about Northern whites coming to incite a slave rebellion. And then finally, the straw that breaks the camel's back is the 1860 election. If you think we live in contentious political times, Abraham Lincoln wins the 1860 election with 39.8% of the popular vote, which really isn't too bad if you consider that he's not on the ballot in 10 states in the South. Effectively, what happens back then is you were elected in November, but you didn't get inaugurated until March. During that time, Lincoln gets elected in November. Seven states, all in the deep south, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, they will secede and they will take all of the federal arsenals and forts, all except for two, Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina, and Fort Pickens in Pensacola, Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, Kentucky and Arkansas are going to wait and see how the new guy does. Now, Abraham Lincoln will establish another precedent followed to this day where he will ignore his best military advice and not give up those two forts. Ultimately, he will tip his hand to the South and says, I won't send one more man, not one more grain of powder. I will just send food and water. You couldn't be against men getting food or water, could you? The South recognizing this will lead to an inevitable stalemate on the 12th of April, 1861, will fire the first shots of the American Civil War. Abraham Lincoln maneuvers the South into firing the first shots. With that, he will call up 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion. And with that, four other Southern states will secede. That's 11 Southern states that have seceded, all of whom have representatives at Gettysburg. Fighting against 24 Union states, 18 of which will have representatives at Gettysburg. Now, because you are at the Army War College, we need to talk about some of this stuff. Uh, So when we talk about our policy strategy formulation model, this may give us a model to use while we're out on the battlefield, and let's talk through how. First of all, we know strategy. You guys have been studying. To the Greeks, this is the art of the general. If we were down in the Pentagon today, this would be a prudent set of ideas for the synchronization and integration of instruments of national power to achieve theater, or theater, regional, and multinational objectives. This is a bit of a yawner and maybe not terribly accurate because if it's a prudent set of ideas, we'd never have a bad strategy. What I would argue perhaps a better definition of strategy comes from Helmut von Mulkey, the elder. He says, strategy is more than a science. It is the application of knowledge to practical life. It is the development of a thought capable of modifying the original idea in light of ever-changing circumstances. It is the art of making decisions under the most extreme pressure. Now, that's a good definition for strategy. We have art and science. We have the idea that it's not just this ethereal set of ideas. Eventually, we got to put rubber in the road and make actions happen. He talks about the idea that it's very cognitive. We have to make decisions, and then we may have to change them based on changing circumstances. And of course, it covers the last thing that leaders have to do, and that is make decisions. So our strategy policy formulation model starts with enduring values and beliefs, and those drive our interests, and interests drive policy, and policy drives strategy. We combine end ways and means and assess it against risk. We know we have this pyramid. As policy comes down through instruments of national power, we'll use an acronym like DIME, diplomacy, information, military, and economic instruments that will now translate through a strategy, operational, and tactical series of roles. For our staff ride, when we talk about the strategic level, I want you to think about winning the American Civil War. At the operational level, I want you to think about the whole Gettysburg campaign. From the time the Confederate Army leaves Virginia on the 3rd of June, 1863, until they cross back over the Potomac River on the 14th of July. And at the tactical level, this is every little fight and battle from the cavalry battles at Upperville and Middleburg and Aldi to the fight for Little Round Top, the Wheatfield or Gettysburg itself. In this idea, direction comes down and results come back up. And there is some imperatives here. Strategy provides some rigor to what we do at the operational and tactical level. Everything we do at the operational or tactical level should take us to our strategic end. And if it doesn't, it's waste which means we will accept suboptimal activities at the operational and tactical level that get us to our strategic end over optimal ones that do not. I think as military professionals, we struggle with this one a bit. Now, there's also some rigor put here, and that's why I have the picture of Clausewitz on this slide. 
and what he's saying is this idea of the value of the political object applies as much to you and I if we're trying to lose weight as it does to an army at war. He would say the value of the political object determines the magnitude and duration of sacrifice. If you want to lose weight, well, how much weight is determined by the magnitude, how hard you work, and the, how long, the duration. For a nation at war, the magnitude of sacrifice is the cost in lives, dollars, and prestige, and of course, time. This puts some parameters on our strategy as surely strategy puts some rigor on the operational and tactical level activities. Now, I know Tom Braschino is going to be pushing back on me, but there is this little mathematical equation that Clausewitz uses as a book that talks about the power resistance as means times will, which means theoretically, and I mean this theoretically, if you go to war, you got to pick what side of that equation you want to target. Ultimately, you will target both. If you're going to target the mean side, that would be annihilation, either all at once or attrition th over time. That's like 95% of the American way of war. Or you can target the adversary's will. This would be a war of exhaustion, not foreign to us as Americans. Our American Revolution was a war of exhaustion. We didn't break all the British stuff. We just wore out their willingness to continue to fight here in North America. We'll continue to talk about this as we go. Now, let's talk about national policy objectives. So on the left of this slide, as you look at it, that's President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy. His principal military advisor is Robert E. Lee. Their goal is independence and a territorial sovereignty of the South. Uh, what I put below that is the seal of the Confederacy. And if you look at the center of that seal, you might recognize George Washington. The Second War of Independence is what they would often call it. And this is an appropriate model, perhaps, for the South. All they have to do is not lose. And if they could get a European power to come in on their side, that would make all the difference. For Abraham Lincoln, advised by his principal military advisor at the start of the war, Winfield Scott, his goal is to preserve the Union. In fact, as late as August 1862, he writes to Horace Greeley and says, my paramount object in this war is to preserve the Union. It is not to save or destroy slavery. If I could free none of the slaves and preserve the Union, I would do that. If I could free all the slaves and preserve the Union, I would do that. If I could free some and leave the others alone and preserve the Union, I would do that too. Remember, Lincoln is a lawyer. He doesn't believe the South has seceded because he would say that no sovereign nation has a provision in its organic law for its own termination. There's no suicide clause in the Constitution that allows states to leave. So we can imagine. Uh, and spoiler alert, when the Union wins the Battle of Gettysburg, George Gordon Meade will write a note to his army. And he says he looks forward to increased exertions to drive the enemy from our soil. Abraham Lincoln is beside himself. It's all our soil. Okay, so let's talk about how instruments of national power are playing out here. There is a diplomatic element of this. Uh, if we think about it, the Confederacy has representatives in England and France. So James Slidell and James Mason are over there trying to get those European powers to come on the South. They are offset by the United States ambassadors to England, Charles Adams and William Dayton in France, trying to keep them out of the war. This is at play all throughout the American Civil War. Informational elements. I think we struggle with this by degree, but perhaps the greatest example is the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation, it goes into effect on January 1st, 1863. When Abraham Lincoln signs this, it frees none of the slaves in the border states. It frees none of the slaves in territory already occupied by the Union. But what it says is, in the 90 days before it takes effect, if a southern state comes back into proper relation to the federal government, no harm, no foul. However, after January 1st, if they do not, for every inch that the Union Army advances, any slaves that come within their line are then thenceforth and forever free. It's an executive power. It's a war power. What he's recognizing is that slave labor is freeing up white Southerners to come and fight on the front lines. He's attacking their economic base. However, what does it do across the ocean? For England that had gotten out of slavery in the 1830s and for France who had gotten out of it in the 1840s, all of a sudden he puts a value proposition in front of the economic interest of those nations to recognize the South. With the stroke of a pen, he frees zero slaves in North America, but almost independently he keeps England and France out of the war. It's brilliant.
And finally, there's an economic aspect. And this is where the South really hung its hat at the beginning of the war. No one will go to war with King Cotton. We should look at how this takes effect. Back at the writing of the Constitution in 1790, the United States produces about 3,000 bales of cotton. In 1793, Eli Whitney develops the cotton gin. Then all of a sudden, we can grow short staple cotton all across the South three seasons a year. So that by 1840, it's five cents a pound. By 1850, it's 11 cents a pound. It'll double again by 1870. 60 when we produce 4.5 million bales of cotton. And nobody will go to war with King Cotton. And the South provides 80% of the world's of the cotton. They provide 80% to England, who has 6 million people tied to the textile industry. That's as many whites as exist in the South at the time. And they provide 90% of France's. Now, a couple of things happen. Timing. When the war starts, the South self embargoes the cotton. They don't send any out because they want Europe to feel the pinch. The problem is there was a cotton glut in 1859 and 1860. Warehouses are bulging all over Europe. Nobody thinks the war is going to go very long. So if you're in Europe, you think, what a good time to get rid of inventory. About the time the South determines we could really use the income from the sale of cotton, the North has started to put in a blockade. Moreover, the markets have already shifted. England is now getting cotton for places like Egypt and India. In fact, if you look at that slide, the blue line shows what the cotton trade looks like uh, in 1858, I believe. And then by 1862, look at how the markets have already shifted. That's how dynamic they've been. Moreover, on the timing issue, a couple of things happen. There's a drought in the early 1860s in England. And if you think about where does England get its grain from, it gets it from the Northeast. So about the time that it has a Well, if we look at Maslow's hierarchy, the need for people to eat is more basic than the need for people to go to work. And about the time they might want to recognize the South, they have to feed their people and their ties are closer to the Union. We can come back to this. Now let's talk about the military objectives. Initially, Abraham Lincoln, informed by his principal military advisor, Winfield Scott, Winfield Scott does a no-kidding traditional two-page information paper to the boss that says, look, now truth be told, he was from Virginia, loyal to the Union. He says, we don't want to invade the South. We'll end up with 15 devastated provinces we'll have to occupy for decades, and it will quadruple the cost it would take to occupy them than they would contribute to our nation in taxes. We don't want to do that. What we should do is blockade the coastline, send a force down the Mississippi River. We will isolate them, and calmer heads will prevail, and they'll come back into the Union. Now, there's some problems with this. That's a 3,500-mile coastline. Uh, At the time, the United States Navy has about 60 ships. Uh, Readiness was really important to the Navy back then, too. So at any one time, 12 of them could go to sea. For the time that it would take to build the Navy would take years. Um, Also, for that drive down the Mississippi, uh, that's going to take almost 60,000 Union soldiers. At the start of the war, the United States Navy, its size is 16,000. It would take a long time to build an army like that. And Scott actually recognizes in his paper, he says, the problem we will run into is the patience of our loyal and patriotic Union friends. And he's absolutely right. Politically, Lincoln couldn't wait for years to do this. So he sends his very green army into battle in the summer of 1861. They lose the first battle of Bull Run, and we are off to the races. By the end of the war, of course, there will be over a million men in Union blue. They will almost execute this exact game plan, and the United States Navy will not number 664 ships, the largest Navy in the world. While they are trying to execute this, another idea comes up, on to Richmond. And here's really the thought of this. During the Mexican War, 10,000 United States soldiers land at Veracruz, Mexico, cross 175 miles of desert, and they capture Mexico City and subdue a nation of 9 million people. Richmond's only 90 miles south of Washington, D.C., Why don't we just go take Richmond? And this will define strategy, at least in the Eastern Theater, for nearly the first two years of the war. Now, on the southern side, we should ask ourselves, should they target means or should they target the will of the Union. Well, let's just take a look at the disparity between the North and the South. If you look at population, uh, in the 1860 census, there's about 31 million people in the United States. 21 million of them live in the North. 10 million of them live in the South. But of those 10 million, 4 million are slaves. Uh, And if they fight for you, you're not who you say you are. So you're outnumbered. Even if you look at urbanization, of all the largest cities in the United States, only one of them is in the South. It's New Orleans. And they lose that in 1862. 
If you think about industrialization, about 84% of the industrial capacity of the nation is in the North, and you can use any metric you want. A 25-mile circle around New York City, there's more industrial capacity in that circle than there is in all the South. There's more factories in the North than there are factory workers in the South. And you go, well, wait a minute. I've been to Tredger Iron Works in Richmond, and I saw they made you know 31,000 small arms during the war, and that's remarkable. The Springfield Armory produces 20,000 a month, and they contract with another 15 firms to do the same. The industrial capacity of the North is significantly greater than that of the South. This translates to things like transportation, railroads. There's about 30,000 miles worth of railroad tracks in the United States, about 20,000 of them in the North, about 10,000 of them in the South. But in the South, there are different gauges, meaning the width of the rails. And so it's harder for them to transport goods across the South. Moreover, because they don't have industrial capacity, they're unable to repair that infrastructure during the war. The North will be way more efficient at sending goods. So let's talk about things like perhaps agriculture and go, well, there's a place the South should have an advantage. They're an agricultural nation, and that's right. But what do they grow in the South? Cotton, indigo, tobacco, rice, and corn, and you can only eat two of those. For the North, although only 40% of it is agricultural, they are buying off on technology, the John Deere stainless steel self-scouring plow. Because the railroads work, they're starting to specialize. They're growing bumper crops, and because they can get them to the cities, they way outproduce the South agriculturally during the war. If we talk about things like finances, the American Civil War gives us our National Legal Tender Act, our National Banking Act, we pay income taxes because the American Civil War. And out of that, Abraham Lincoln keeps the inflation weight to about 80%, which we should say is not bad. In World War I, it's about 84%, and in World War II, it's about 70%, so we'll say that's pretty good. What about the inflation rate in the South? By the end of the war, the inflation rate's nearly 5,725%. They are taxing people in kind. Um, and so what we find is the South decides to go after union will. Uh, the problem is we know today wars of exhaustion usually take 8 to 12 or more years. They're not sure they're going to get there. But if you read Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee's accounts, they talk about this growing war weariness. This idea that the union population after two years of the war are convinced that the value of the political object is no longer worth it. We are not showing progress. There's hundreds of thousands of dead and there's no end in sight. That's what they're going to try and tap into. Ultimately, two weeks after the Battle of Gettysburg, there are draft riots in New York City. Again, that feeling that there's this growing feeling in the North. This isn't working. And we see it in the midterm elections in 1862. The Democrats will win some 22 seats in the House of Representatives. That's what they're going to try and tap. So here's the strategic situation. In May of 1863, Robert E. Lee, after his greatest victory at Chancellorsville, where he violates all kind of military principles, he divides his force three times in the face of a larger army, and he still wins out number two to one. He goes to Richmond, and they have this conference saying, what should we do? If you look at the map, the red line is the territorial integrity of the South at the beginning of the war. The blue line is where the southern border is, after two years of war. And what you can see is, notice the Anaconda plan is in effect. You can see some of the uh, ports on the coastline have been taken. You can see New Orleans has fallen. We can see Ulysses S. Grant is driving down the Mississippi River. In fact, the South only holds 200 miles of that vital uh, line of communication. So their options are, should we send some troops out there to try and stop Grant? Well, one, they're not sure they're going to get there in time. Two, the commander at Vicksburg is a guy named John Pemberton. He's from Pennsylvania. We're not even sure he's on our side. And actually, they're worried that he would incompetently use them. That's taken off the table. The second thought is maybe we give them to uh, Braxton Bragg in the middle of the country to drive up towards Ohio and perhaps pull some of Grant's troops back to help defend those northern states. Now, remember, this is the 1800s. If you won a battle, and even though the result was in your favor, but then you left the battlefield. You left the field. That was considered a loss. Braxton Bragg has done this twice already. If you look at the map again, the blue splotches are Union victories. The red one are Confederate victories. You can see in the Eastern Hold Theater, the Confederacy is holding their own. And Robert E. Lee would say, we might lose the war in the West, but we can't win it in the West. We could win it in the East, though. What we should do is scrape all the troops we could from the Eastern Theater, give them to me, let me invade the North, and if I win a crushing victory in the North, this will help us win the war. And that's the course that they agree upon. 
So when we think about Robert E. Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia being on the Gettysburg campaign, their objectives are to win the war. Yes, there are aspects of this being a raid. Yes, he's trying to get the war out of Virginia to let them be able to harvest one season's worth of crops. Yes, he's going to feed his army out of Pennsylvania that's been untouched by the hard hand of war. But this is not a raid. Although he has continued to win at the Eastern Theater, every time he defeats that Union army, they slide back across the Rappahannock River and he can't get at those people. What he wants to do is lure that Union army out in the open and annihilate it in one climactic battle and provide the ultimate evidence to that northern population that the sacrifice for this war is no longer worth it. There are some who believe that another victory in the East would bring with it European recognition. Neither Jefferson Davis nor Robert E. Lee believe this. So when we get out on that field, understand why Robert E. Lee is there, to annihilate the Union Army that he might win the war. Okay, here's his plan. On this map, this is the Eastern Theater of the United States. The Confederates are in red, the Union in blue. You can see Washington to the north and Richmond to the south, the two armies separated by the Rappahannock River. Starting on the 3rd of June, 1863, Robert E. Lee will throw his army over the Appalachian Mountains and use the Shenandoah Valley as an avenue of invasion. He always believed the Union Army will follow me. In fact, he shares his vision for how this whole thing will go on the 27th of June. He says, I believe the Union Army will come up probably through Frederick. They'll be hungry, strung out by hard marching, and much demoralized. And as they enter into Pennsylvania, I will throw an overwhelming force against their front and follow up my success, crush one corps and drive it back upon another. And through successive repulses and surprises before they can concentrate, I will create a panic and virtually annihilate the Union Army. Now that's a vision statement, right? It captures the environment, it captures the enemy, and it captures what he's going to do. And gang, we're going to talk about all kinds of ranges out on the battlefield. Well, that rifled cannon could shoot a mile and a half and that rifled musket could shoot 300 yards. And of all the distances on a battlefield, the most critical ones are the three inches or the six inches between people's ears. If you think about it, Robert E. Lee with that last line, I will create a panic and annihilate the army. He is playing in the moral sphere. Now, what does he have? He's got about 75,000 soldiers. This is almost the most he's had since he took command of this army a year ago. He's added troops to his army. Now, there are some things that are different, though. Up to this point, his success has always been based upon this organization that had Robert E. Lee at the top, Jeb Stewart as his cavalry commander, James Longstreet as one corps commander, and Stonewall Jackson as another. In the battle before Gettysburg at Chancellorsville in the beginning of May, Stonewall Jackson is killed. Robert E. Lee is going to reorganize his army. His assumption is, with the new organization, I will be just as effective as I've always been. Is that a sound assumption? We should ask ourselves why we're out on the battlefield. Because that's not the only change that sits out there. So two of his three corps commanders are new. Four of his nine division commanders are new. Twelve of his 37 brigade commanders are new. If you are familiar with the Peter Principle, basically you will be promoted until you are incompetent. Um, The Peter Principle is massively in effect on all Civil War battlefields of almost a third of all commanders serving in positions they've never served in before. The gentleman on the right of that slide is Abner Perrin from South Carolina. Imagine in Fredericksburg in December... He is a company commander responsible for perhaps 35 men. In May, at Chancellorsville, he is now a regimental commander responsible for 350 men. In Gettysburg in July, he's now a brigade commander responsible for 1,500 men. What prepares him from December to July to go from commanding 35 to commanding 1,500 men? Robert E. Lee recognizes not only are they running out of manpower as a resource, they are running out of leadership. In fact, he'll write to John Bell Hood, one of his division commanders, and he'll say, I too believe this army would be invincible if only it could be properly organized and officered. There never was such men in an army before, but there is the difficulty. Proper commanders, where can they be obtained? What we should take out of all this is in every fight up to this point, Robert E. Lee has been outgunned and outnumbered. And up to this point, he is 4-0-1. He has won four campaigns. He's never lost. And I'm calling the Antietam campaign a tie. I'm sure you've seen this picture before. This is a picture of Confederate prisoners uh, taken after Gettysburg during the during the pursuit. Uh, I put those two comments on there just to get an idea of the flavor of the Army of Northern Virginia. The first is from an Englishman who's observing the war uh, and his idea that says of the profound contempt for the enemy that they have beaten so often. 
And then the other one may be more important to me. Uh, Edward Porter Alexander is probably the best artillerist in the Confederacy during the American Civil War. And he says, we look forward to victories under Robert E. Lee like successive sunrises. The South feels it like they can win under Robert E. Lee, and Robert E. Lee believes he can win with that army. Now, for the Union options, once Robert E. Lee starts to move, the commander of the Army of the Potomac, the principal Union army in the Eastern Theater, says, hey, this is great. Now that the Army's out of the way, let's go on to Richmond. Now, Abraham Lincoln at the beginning of the war would make suggestions to his generals, but he's been boning up on a strategy over there reading at the Library of Congress, and at this point in the war, he's done making suggestions. He will now say, Lee's army and not Richmond is your true objective. And Hooker goes, Roger that, on to Richmond. And Lincoln says, no, no, I need you to go after Robert E. Lee. And he goes, right, right, on to Richmond. And he says, no, 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 you need to go get Lee's army. Lincoln already has started to understand. If he goes and gets Lee's army, he can go get Richmond whenever he wants. And to take Richmond with Robert E. Lee and that army still out there wouldn't end the war at all. Now, the Union Army of the Potomac, this is the principal Union Army in the Eastern Theater, the Federals, uh, the Blue, the Northerners. Their job, nominally, is to guard Washington, D.C. About every three months, they fight the Confederate Army that Robert E. Lee commands. And as surely as Robert E. Lee is 4-0-1, they are 0-4-1. And every time they lose or tie, they get a new commander. Going into the Battle of Gettysburg, they're going to have about 93,000 men. But we should keep something in mind. It's the army, so we don't count the same. The Confederates will only count people that can pull triggers. Infantrymen, artillerists, cavalrymen. Uh, on the Union side, we count everybody. Cooks, bakers, and candlestick makers. So if you think about it, the combat power is actually more even than you know. Now, we should ask ourselves, how did this happen? The Union usually way outnumbers the Confederate army. Well, they lose 17,000 men at the Battle of Chancellorsville, and then... The states of New York and Maine had signed up two-year enlistments. Those expire between Chancellorsville and Gettysburg. So during that two-month period, 28,000 men march out of the Union Army. And this is what allows us to have near parity on this battlefield at Gettysburg. Of course, they also have new corps commanders. Winfield Scott Hancock, uh, George Sykes are new to their command positions too. I'll show you this picture. You're going to meet these gentlemen at your first stop, or most of you will meet them at your first stop, depending on how your guide does this. But if you read that quote, remember Lee's assumption that they will be much demoralized because of their many losses, because of the disruption of units that have fought next to each other with all these men that have left. But if you read that quote, you kind of get an idea that perhaps, perhaps they're not that demoralized. They just need a chance. Here's how this is going to go down. Again, Confederates in red, Union in blue. They're going to start to move north, and as Lee predicted, the Union army will follow him. Uh, Lee's cavalry, three types of troops in the American Civil War. We have our cavalry, the guys riding around on horses. Those are your eyes and ears. Gathering intelligence and screening the enemy so they can't gather intelligence on you. You have your artillerists firing long-range artillery cannon in support of infantry and artillery. And finally, you have your infantrymen, guys marching around with their rifled muskets for abreast, and they are the decisive arm in the American Civil War. Those small arms account for anywhere between 71 and 95 percent of all casualties on Civil War battlefields. Lee's cavalry, uh, his intelligence arm, has asked for permission and is given it to ride around a piece of the Union Army because they're guarding the mountain passes, and what he's trying to do is get back on the leading edge. Now, his cavalry officer has already ridden entirely around the Union Army twice before. He was gone for three and four days respectfully and was wildly successful. When he gets permission, this time, he starts to ride around a piece of the Union Army, but that's when the entire Union Army starts to move north, and now he's not cutting off a piece. He has to ride all the way around it. So when you see that map and you see the little red piece over there by Washington, D.C., Robert E. Lee loses his eyes and ears not for three or four days, but for eight days, including the first two days of the Battle of Gettysburg. We should keep our eye on that. Now, on the 28th of June, George Gordon Meade is the commander of the 5th Corps. He's in Frederick. He falls asleep. A member from the War Department staff will come up and wake him up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he says, I've come to bring you trouble. And his trouble is he's now in command of the Army of the Potomac. Imagine, one of our greatest operational military commanders in our nation history, Robert E. Lee, is now raging through the North. The fate of the Republic hangs in the balance, and you have three days to try and unfarkle this whole situation. That's what George Gordon Gordon Meade is handed on the 28th of June. We should ask ourselves, why would Lincoln take the risk of changing the commanders? Now, he didn't know there's going to be a battle fought in three days, but he knows there's going to be a battle fought soon. 
Well, his thought is, if the commander has a different vision onto Richmond than I have, that's strategic risk. If I swap commanders, that's an operational or a tactical risk. I'm willing to take that. And so he changes the commander on the 28th of June. Now, Meade isn't Lincoln's first choice. He's arguably his second or his fourth, depending how much credibility you put in the conversations between other generals. And when other generals would turn it down, always the next question was, if not you, who? And to a man, they all say, I trust George Gordon Meade. Now, his orders are find Robert E. Lee, fight Robert E. Lee, and stay between Robert E. Lee and Washington and Baltimore. Now, he's given a special power, unique, of he's allowed to ignore seniority. At this point in the war, the senior rank is a two-star general. In the middle of a battle, if we all got up on the hill and went, hey, we're all two-stars, that's awesome. Who's in charge? We would go, well, I got promoted last week, and you got promoted last month, and you got promoted two months ago, four months ago. You're six. You're, oh, you're the senior guy? You're in charge. Straight seniority. Meade is allowed to ignore that. It's a powerful tool in his toolkit. We'll see how he uses it during this campaign. The other thing he does is he keeps a list. Uh, and I'm sure you all do too. You know, we all carry around our little green government issue notebooks. You know, the last page are phone numbers and emails for you to keep up with. The second to last page are book recommendations that people make and you dutifully write down and are never going to read. And then the third to last page, though, is someday when I'm king. And you guys know this. We spend a whole lifetime standing in formations and you listen to a commander who gives some sage advice and you go, wow, that's brilliant. Someday when I'm king, I'm going to say that. There's a flip side to that coin. We've also stood in enough formations to hear senior commanders speak and go, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Someday when I'm king, I'm never going to say that. And what George Gordon Meade does on the day he gets command is he takes three young cavalry captains and he promotes them to brigadier general. Besides being a really sweet pay raise, what he wants is young, aggressive cavalry commanders to try and match that of Jeb Stuart and his Confederate counterparts. Now, the other thing he does is he starts to be very meticulous about when he would get, he used to, as a corps commander, just get his march orders, but not know what anybody else was doing. Now he starts to issue march orders. When you got your march orders, you got everybody else's. And when I got my march orders, I got everybody else's. We would call this today building a common operational picture. And finally, he starts to develop things that we would call today as branch plans. As he starts to march north, he goes, what if we ran into a day? Could we fight there? And he starts to study these things in case things go awry. Now, the idea of the control of time, space, and forces that are interaction, we know is a key prerequisite for successful military planning and operations. But if you think about where George Gordon Meade is on the 28th, the orders that he gets, defend Washington and defend Baltimore. That's inherently defensive. But you're also the army of operation to operate against Robert E. Lee. Well, those are not overlapping missions, and each one provides constraints on the other. If I'm going to be an army of an operation, I still got to defend Baltimore and Washington. And oh, by the way, if I'm defending Baltimore and Washington, I don't have that much leeway to be an army of operation. This is his explicit task. He has some implied tasks too. And we find him as he writes his wife. He says, I believe I have to rescue Harrisburg. No Union state capital has fallen to the south yet. Um, he believes that he's also got to keep his troops in close proximity. In fact, when he gets command, he thinks they're too far spread out. So he's got to provide protection for his force. And he needs to preserve options, both for the defensive role and as the army of operation. The problem is he doesn't actually know where the Confederate army is. So here's how it's going to go. He's going to break his army up into three wings, and he's going to advance them, very much keeping mutual support between those parallel columns. Napoleon would refer to the battalion curé, always a, a day's march distance away from one another that they might support one another, protection. And that's where they would be by the 30th. He would put his cavalry divisions, his best cavalry division on his left flank, because that's where he expects to find them, his next best cavalry division on his right flank, because your flanks are vulnerable, and his new cavalry division out in front, eyes and ears looking for the enemy. And then what he's going to do, if you think about the approaches that were from where the Confederate positions are generally known to be, should they go towards Baltimore or Washington, look at how he's arranged in his army. So he's advanced to be the army of operation, but he's also shielding Baltimore and Washington. Next, what he's going to do is he comes up with a branch plan, the Pipe Creek line in Maryland. If all things go wrong, if we run into the enemy, we can always fall back to that position. And you can see again from the map how that covers both the approaches to Baltimore and Washington. And the last thing he's going to do is he's going to take his base of supply and he's going to move it from Frederick 
to Westminster. He's moving it because he's going to shift his lines of operation north. And if you see where that is sitting in Westminster, it supports both of those missions. I would argue George Gordon Meade in three days is showing to be an operational artist as he controls his force over that space in time, knowing that they all have to be in close support of one another. Okay, here's where we're going to be on our first stop when we get out at Gettysburg. On the 28th of June, Robert E. Lee and his army spread out on a 55-mile arc from Chambersburg in the west to Carlisle in the north and even over to York in the northeast when he gets word from Harrison the spy because he doesn't have his cavalry. Remember, he's loath to get information from a spy, but he tells him, guess what? The Union Army is just across the Maryland border and they have a new commander. Robert E. Lee's army is spread out over that 55 miles. He knows he's outnumbered. We cannot fight this way, so he's going to issue his orders that evening. I need us to concentrate, but don't bring on a battle until we're all together. Ironically enough, this is why at Gettysburg, the Confederate Army will come from the north and west and the Union Army will come from the South. Of course, we know that same day is the same day that George Gordon Meade gets command of the Union Army and will start to go after them. Now, I said Robert E. Lee has no cavalry. Let's just do one little vignette we can break apart. Um, when Jeb Stuart rides around the Union Army, he takes three brigades of cavalry, but Robert E. Lee has four other cavalry brigades. He doesn't lose all his eyes and ears. So we should ask ourselves, what happens? Well, first of all, he takes the best three brigade commanders with him. Even James Longstreet says, why don't you leave Wade Hampton behind? He goes, nope, I'm taking him with him. So who does he leave behind? Well, he leaves behind uh, Imbenen and Jenkins cavalry. These are irregular cavalry that are used to operating in West Virginia. They're not used to operating with the Army of Northern Virginia. Robert E. Lee's not very big on these guys. And they're the ones that are largely guarding his artillery supplies. They're the ones gathering up the tens of thousands of horses and cavalry cattle and sheep and goats and all that stuff that they are pilfering out of Pennsylvania and sending back to Richmond. Well, you go, okay, okay. But she's still got two others. Okay, so the two others are, first one is Beverly Robertson. Uh, that's Beverly Robertson in the middle of the three pictures. Beverly Robertson was once engaged to Flora Jones Cook. That's the young lady on the very left of the bottom slide. She was a beauty from Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Beverly Robertson was once engaged to her, but she doesn't marry Beverly Robertson. I'll give you a guess on who she actually marries. She marries Jeb Stewart. Jeb Stewart, they date for about two months. He famously says, I came, I saw, I was conquered, and she marries him. Do you think Jeb Stewart and Beverly Robertson get along? Of course they do not, so he can't go on Jeb Stewart's ride. And the last person that leaves is kind of the, the guy there with the dark beard looking rather grumpy, and his name is Grumble Jones. Now, if your nickname is Grumble, what do you think your interpersonal skills are like? Yeah, Jeb Stewart doesn't write long letters unless Grumble Jones is up for promotion. And then he writes very long letters on why he should not be promoted. All of this is to say that Lee did have options, but personalities matter. Jeb Stewart takes all the best cavalry with him, and ultimately these other resources do not get used. We say you had better know what's going on two levels above you, and this makes sense. If I can make my boss's boss successful, we will be successful. And moreover, in our profession, you're only ever two bullets away from standing on those shoes. You should think at that level. But we should also caution ourselves. We had better know what's going on two levels below, too. Because I would argue nine times out of ten, our subordinates are acting on their own prejudice rather than our organizational objectives. Jeb Stewart is a case in point. Truth be told here, you know, we often talk about that we are swimming in sensors and drowning in data. Imagine a Civil War battlefield, all the cavalrymen riding down these back farm lanes, sending back notes and little strips of information. It's Jeb Stewart who takes all those and goes, well, that's not important. Well, that's not important. Ooh, that's valuable. And of all those pieces coming in, he's the one that feeds them to Robert E. Lee. And with that, Robert E. Lee is 4-0-1. And, and so it's almost as if his entire cavalry arm is encapsulated in one man, and that one man is not there. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.